Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Atlas Copco Q4 2019 report. Today, I am pleased to present CEO Mats Ramström and CFO Hans Ola Meyer. For the first part of this call, all participants will be in listen-only mode, and afterwards, there will be a question and answer session. Speakers, please begin. Thank you very much, uh, and very welcome to everybody to this uh, quarter four and full year report from Atlas Copco. Uh, we will uh, soon hear uh, Mats Roms from our CEO's comments to the quarter. Uh, but before that, uh, I'll also repeat again uh, what the operator said. We will have a Q&A session. And for that, I also remind, as I usually do, that we prefer if you stay on one question each and then come back in the queue for questions if so required. Um, with that, I think we kick right off, Matt. Okay, thank you, Hans uh, Ola. And I will start on page uh, number two. And if we compare a little bit Q3 with uh, Q4, uh, we can see that we operate in a somewhat uh, softer uh, business climate. And a little bit what stands out, of course, is the auto sector. Uh, we have seen a decline. 1% uh, organic uh, growth. Um, and what continue strong uh, compressive technique and also so strong on, on, on vacuum. We continue to uh, grow the service business. Uh, three out of four business areas continue to build on our resilience and have organic growth. And a solid uh, profitability for the quarter. Go to slide number three. And uh, you can see then the numbers that confirming this. And you can see 25 and a half uh, on orders received and 27 billion on revenues, which is the record for it. So both orders received and revenues was solid performance uh, for the quarter. Uh, I think I go on the operating profit margins to the adjusted one. It's adjusted for two things, and you recognize when the share is strong, development, we have a revaluation of the LTE programs, so that's 221 million. And then we have been top on the softening market in auto, and we have the restructuring cost on 65 for industrial technique. Uh, and looking at that, then you are at 5.9 billion and a 7% growth for the operating profit. Uh, Hans Ola will take you through a little bit more uh, granularity on the cash flow and also return on capital employed later. But maybe just looking at the graph uh, before we change, and you can see it's uh, quite a solid uh, month anyway, considering. Go to slide number four. And this is the full year down and uh, supported by currency. But we had them record orders, record revenues, and, and record uh, profit. Um, and of course, we can see the continued growth for uh, compressor technique, mainly the large compressors throughout the years, and stronger than Q3, Q4 for vacuum, and a little bit softer power at the end of the year, but good, good development. And good for the resilience that we can see them both geographically, that they're growing in a good way, and also that service helps us to build on the continued resilience. Uh, we have uh, a record number of acquisitions that we have done uh, for the quarter, for the year. And the main part of those are distributors for CT that we build on, on the business. It is a very solid business model for us that we have done a number of years. But we also acquired some new platforms for growth, and that's entering a little bit to the chiller business. I'm very excited about the dispense acquisition in electronics. And, of course, we have the, the cryo business from Brooks, but also the on-site uh, gas generation. So please do that. And the proposed dividend um, from the board down is up 11% to uh, Seven kroner and in two installments. We go to slide number five. And here 
that you told here in, in numbers then, and, and maybe the one the one that uh, we are extra proud of is uh, 104 billion in principle for revenues, and it's the first time a little bit of milestone for us since we are back above 100 billion uh, after the liquid with the uh, FROC. It's a good number for us and a solid uh, solid margin. I go to slide number six. I think you can read this in in two ways. Um, you can see it's all green, uh, which is, is very promising, both for year and for the quarter. Um, you can see that we have 35% of our business in Asia. And one of the group regions is still Asia for us. We're happy about that. Uh, but internally, we start more talking and challenging ourselves. How, how do we get to alignment with the GDP development globally? Uh, so this is a very uh, positive development for us. If you take a negative approach on it, uh, it's the auto sector. Uh, for the quarter, uh, you have a decline in both North America, uh, in Brazil, in Europe, and in Asia. So it's uh, quite uh, um, consistent uh, throughout the geographical uh, region for us. To give you a little bit more um, details, starting with North America, we continue to have a strong uh, compressor technique driven by uh, larger compressors, uh, strong vacuum uh, supported by the cryo technologies, and uh, significantly softer industrial technique uh, with um, the, the auto linked to the auto and the somewhat uh, weaker power as well. If we go to Brazil, I think the view is in generally fairly positive. And uh, the only business area that is negative is also linked to auto, which is industrial. Then. Europe, uh, strong uh, compressor technique, strong uh, vacuum, negative uh, industrial as well, especially the link to Germany and the auto industry there, and a flat uh, uh, power technique. Then we look at the year for Asia, uh, and also the quarter for the Asia, you can see that's uh, quite a positive development, and of course uh, here we see that the development in in semi kicks in in vacuum, uh, which is very positive. But also the compressor technique uh, and power technique has a positive development both for the quarter and the year. So it's uh, that we have a product range today that is very uh, competitive on this market, which is uh, it's a necessity for for the development of the company for the future. Go to slide uh, number seven. I can just confirm then that we have five quarters now with, with, with growth. Um, if we go to slide number eight, you can still see that we have support from currency, uh, both on orders and revenue, around 4%. And then we can also link in them uh, the structure changes the acquisition down so that three on um, orders and or organic down one percent. We go to slide number nine. Uh, nothing really new. What stands out as a uh, stellar performance for the quarter would be the, the vacuum technique. Um, they have C groups in, in both semi. They have C groups in industrial and scientific, uh, and also in service, and, and a very solid profitability, uh, considering then that we also have uh, Brooks diluting the bottom line a little bit. Uh, also positive for compressor technique, and you can see then double digits um, for, for industrial and on orders. We take business area by business area and maybe start on, on the graph. Uh, so very solid for being a Q4 for them, both on orders, also very good uh, revenues. Um, you can also see that we continue then the service and development in, in, in a positive way, um, taking advantage more and more of for those uh, participating in the capital market they that could see a lot of what they do on the digitalization and, and connectivity. I think step by step we can take advantage of that and help that uh, journey in, in service as well. The one thing that we see that is deviated a little bit from uh, previous quarter is that we see then the smaller industry
industrial compressors that is the uh, a lower demand uh, for those, but we have continued then on, on the bigger compressors. That's a little bit fine on on the on the demand in the marketplace. Uh, operating margin at 23.1, and that of course um, includes the number of acquisitions that we will see the full impact in the coming years. I think that's quite solid as well. Another product in the corner there. This is um, continuing them. We, we are growing quite rapidly in uh, in low pressure, and this is a, a, another addition to that uh, portfolio of, of products. Uh, vacuum technique on slide number 11. Here you can see the last two quarters, Q3 and, and Q4, uh, very solid uh, uh, development. And it's in principally the same comments as I had in Q3. Um, it's uh, the development of the Chinese uh, the market, uh, where they're building up the same industry. Uh, that's very positive for us. And we can see the, uh, the traditional OEM players also continue to invest in, in technology. And we see, have seen on the, when semi was down a little bit, we could see a correlation between industrial and scientific, and there is such a little bit. And we can see both industrial and, and scientific being positive um, uh, for the quarter. So uh, strong orders received, strong invoicing, and, and uh, continue them very strong operating, uh, operating margin. And of course, we have to remind ourselves that the 24.3 includes uh, groups or trio, I should say. Industrial technique on slide uh, number 12. And uh, we flagged a little bit for a softer out of market in a number of quarters. And you can see that many of the customers in this segment um, uh, are a little bit in transformation. Uh, one is then, of course, from uh, traditional combustion engine to either hybrid or, or full electric vehicles. Uh, we can also see that in principally the output, the production rate for, for last year is down. We normally don't uh, align fully with that. It's more project driven. But at the same time, we can see that they run a lot of cost out programs. And we can see the effect of that is that they push a little bit traditional technologies forward um, or change their mind a little bit uh, on, on the platform they're building. So this is in full effect uh, right now in the quarter. And you can see that the orders were uh, quite weak, although we kept up uh, the revenues. Um, and here we have said then that we take the cost and, and restructure a little bit. Um, in the in the quarter you saw 65 million down, uh, to adjust a little bit the, the the cost structure for future demand as well. I should say though that going to uh, hybrid or electric vehicles with the investments we have done, if you build a battery car. You can come for them um, the dispense technology, uh, which you use for mixed materials. Uh, you need it for self riveting if you like to use aluminum to aluminum. Uh, flow drilling, uh, similar thing there. Uh, so we are in a very good position uh, actually to be part of this transformation to electric vehicles. And you can see the battery pack as a new engine. And there are a number of, of physical applications for those technologies on, on the battery pack as well. So even though it's a little bit down now, we believe that we have the right technology to be part of this um, transformation going forward. We take power, um, order down 2%. Um, we have not really seen a full impact on any weakness in the construction market. Uh, in our case, it's a uh, weaker U.S. market. And we have seen some of the equipment companies uh, not placing as many orders as they have in the past, although it's, it's only down 2%. But of course, a very
very important quarter to see the trend in this business with the Q1, which should be the third seasonality in this business, and we should then see if uh, we get a strong uh, Q1 or not in this. So I have to look forward a little bit to that. But otherwise, you can see the four, four quarters for year is not too bad, so it's okay. And an operating margin of 16, considering the segment, I would say that we are pleased with that anyway. Yeah, this is um, uh, the summary a little bit. Um, I think I can hand the work to you, Okay, thank you much. Let's have a look a little bit beyond the operating process that uh, must have commented quite extensively uh, already. Of course, in the slide number 14 here, all of the margin uh, numbers that you see on the different levels are the reported ones, whereas in the in the Q4 report that we have all received, you can also see the adjusted ones, uh, which gives perhaps a little bit better explanation on how the quarter on an adjusted basis was. Uh, on that note, uh, between operating profit and profit before tax, it is of course missing uh, the financial net. And uh, the minus 55 uh, of this year, the million Swedish krona, albeit being a little bit lower than perhaps what we had uh, expected, I mean a slightly lower interest net negative, uh, it contrasts very much with the positive 273 million that we had in the Q4 last year. But as we commented, that was an, uh, a special gain that we had uh, after repatriation of equity from abroad, uh, equity denominated in euros, so we made quite a, a hefty capital gain and an FX gain on that. Um, adjusted for that last year, for the financial net in 2018 Q4 was 89 million. I would say going forward that somewhere between this year's 55 and last year's 89 is probably a, 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 a rough estimate what we would expect uh, per quarter going forward. Um, if we go further down, we come to the tax. And again, it was more last year that had an extraordinary positive impact with about 600 million of one-off um, extraordinary tax uh, booked uh, positive effect. So if we adjust for that, uh, it was roughly 24% income tax last year compared to the 22.3 this year. My comment would be very similar to the financial net, so that if we expect somewhere in the future between 23 and 24% of, of effective tax, that's, that's more, more uh, to be expected, I would say. And that goes, of course, also to the earnings per share. Final comment on this slide. Uh, many of you have noticed that, of course, the return on capital employed has decreased, and it's a full three percentage points, which is rare uh, in our case, perhaps. But I would say that uh, two, percent, two percentage points out of that is related to accounting, basically. So it's the IFRS 16 impact, and it's also uh, uh, an impact on, on some other accounting changes. So on a comparable basis, you can say that the positive impact on returns that we have had from, from um, over, the, over the full year, I would, uh, I would stress, uh, from currency has been compensated for the dilution that the new acquisitions bring to the group. So that explains a little bit that three percentage points loss on the return on capital employed, which obviously always is a full year, uh, 12 month uh, number. If we then move to the next slide, number 15, uh, we have the profit bridge. And uh, I think the, the only comment here before we look at the business areas, on the next slide is that the current impact on operating profit, uh, looking again, the 165, that is, for, for this quarter, we would expect something similar 
judging from where we have the currencies today or the FX rates today uh, for Q1 compared to Q1 uh, in 2019. That's what one, one could expect at this moment at least. But as I said, let's move on to slide number 16. And um, again, I need to repeat myself, I, we shouldn't focus too much on separate quarters. But at least for transparency reasons, in this way it comes out. Um, it shows, of course, that the operating profit uh, of vacuum technique and compressor technique has responded very well to the volume increase that they've had, uh, over and above what would be a long-term average, of course. Uh, you can also see that currency has helped, of course, in absolute numbers, but if we weigh it together, it has been slightly negative uh, effect on the operating profit margin compared to Q4 in 2018. Um, I think those are the, the, the main things to comment there, and if there is anything that you wonder about, of course, we can come back to this in Q&A. Uh, moving to slide number 17, again, not so much more to add. Uh, you see, of course, that uh, in a year's time, we have increased on a life for life basis from 100 billion to 112 billion in total assets. And, and uh, uh, from that, uh, we can say that about 3 billion of that is coming from uh, currency translation, pure and simple. And about 6 billion comes from the acquisition of Brooks in the middle of the year. So that leaves an organic increase of the balance sheet of somewhere around two to three billion Swedish kroner. Otherwise, not so much uh, specific to add to that. Um, I go on to slide number 18. Uh, it's the sum of everything in one way. It's the cash flow. And uh, we managed to edge just above the five billion on the operating cash flow performance, uh, leading to uh, a 14.6 billion, which is the highest number we've had in a year following uh, the after the split from Epiroc, of course. Uh, the only thing that uh, to be noted is uh, what we mentioned also in the report that the investment didn't completely die in Q4. It was actually the effect of a positive effect from having a say leaseback transaction recorded in, in the cash flow on the investment net number there. So underlying the, the number was more in line with last year, actually. We go on from there, and uh, finally, on the earnings per share and dividend, well, not told us. It was seven uh, krona that the board proposes to the AGM, which means an 11% increase over the 630 uh, krona from last year. And again, as I, as I have said a couple of times, the earnings per share last year was a bit flattered by this extra positive uh, tax bookings that we had at the end of last year. So with that, I think I, I just uh, leave it to Mats to finalize before we go to the Q&A. So the near term outlook then on slide 20, and here we try a little bit to guide uh, what we see in the different segments in the market. Uh, and uh, when we now go from Q4 to Q1 then uh, sequentially, uh, we can see that the one change that we see in the market is mainly in the general industry market uh, that of course impacts um, uh, industrial technique, uh, but also in CC with the industrial compressors. Um, so we can see that it's a softer demand there. Um, we have no reason really to VC. It's still a key account. We have not seen too many capacity investments with the exception of, of China. Uh, utilization is still uh, hovering a little bit. Uh, and that's why we have also guided them a little bit for uh, somewhat softer demand than what we see in, in Q1. Of course. Oh, sorry. Yeah. And 
and uh, indeed we have not included any impact from uh, possible uh, China. Uh, we follow the development of the coronavirus. Um, we'll see how that will develop. We can see that ourselves, we will have uh, our factories will be closed one more week. Uh, we'll just extend that before we uh, start our production, and that is our plan right now. And we can see that at many of our customers as well. Uh, we'll see how that develops, and that's mainly then uh, um, yeah, to see what happens in, in, in all of this development. Thank you, Mats. Uh, I'll uh, just ask the operator to repeat the procedure for the question and answer, then we will write at it. So, ladies and gentlemen, if you wish to ask a question, please press 0 and 1 on your telephone keypad. The first question is from Guillermo Painer of UBS. Your lines are open. Hi, good afternoon. I wanted to ask a question regarding CT, uh, which relates also to a question in Dasso Vacuum, which is, you know, during 2019, you did have a very strong performance from a growth perspective. From part of the growth, tailwinds came from the, um, you know, self-inflicted, let's say, new product development cycle. Uh, and I was wondering, into 2020, whether that created an artificial, let's say, high growth rate uh, for you, in essence, and, and uh, whether, you know, that development cycle continues to be as strong as it was in 2019. And that relates to the question of industrial vacuum as well. Um, I guess, you know, what I wanted to understand is how does it compare when it's growing now, um, as reported today, versus the declines in most of types of industrial compressors that we see on, on the other side of CT. And i leave it at that. Sorry. Thank you. But on the, on the CT side, um, for, the, for the, the large compressors, uh, we have a strong belief that it's uh, supported by a new generation of oil-free machines. And also in gas and process that we see that they have developed uh, a number of, of segments. This is more product business, but we also see that uh, in those two areas, I would say that we uh, believe that we are gaining market share driven by uh, energy efficiency of all of new products. Uh, we are also launching uh, a lot of new products in the industrial segment, but in the industrial segment, I would say we can see uh, a somewhat uh, softer demand for products, and I would say it's more of a short-term capex uh, decision for, for, for the management team there. More on the long term, you can see that it has continued. We have no reason really to uh, believe that it would be uh, softer on, on the large compressors. Um, on industrial, uh, I agree with you when I talked about the general industry market that it could be a strong correlation with the uh, industrial power tools uh, and smaller compressors. Uh, and uh, but here there is a link between um, the industrial vacuum, uh, overlapping a little bit the drive in semi. Uh, you can, for example, say that our vacuum application on a mobile phone that both goes into uh, uh, the semi side, but also the industrial side. Uh, that's a little bit the correlation, but also there I can see that we are launching uh, a number of products, uh, and I would of course be uh, disappointed if those didn't take market share, uh, especially on the energy efficiency. Um, now we start to link more and more also the energy efficiency was the financial payback for us many years ago, uh, and still is. Uh, but now we see the environmental really taking off. Uh, people have an interest to make sure that the carbon footprint is reduced as well. So get a little bit of financial impact on your decision, but also a benefit on that too. To have the most energy efficient product in large and industrial compressors will be of, of great importance as, as I see. Thank you. The next question is from Klaus Bergerland of Suti. Your line is now open. Um, yes, hi, Mats and Hans Ola. It's Klaus from Suti. So uh, uh, the first one, Mats, is, is coming back to the guidance. Obviously, uh, we hear you on automotive, but I'm interested in your comment on the industrial side again. It seems like 
like you just said, it's more weakness on the smaller and medium side. The larger compressors and gap are still holding up. Um, if you just confirm that, and then if you could tell us a little bit more by region on the smaller and medium side, we're hearing from others that China is looking a bit better now uh, towards the end of the quarter, but I, I guess you don't see that, so I will start there. Um, let's see with the, with the China question to start with that. Then. Uh, we have not really seen, if we link that to auto, um, we have not seen an improvement, uh, and I think it's probably the area where it's most challenging uh, in terms of developing the auto, auto industry right now for us. Um, so that's linked to, to new programs available for us in Principi then. And if you look at statistics, I, I think I reported something that last year they closed 22 factories and they opened five. Uh, and in the previous years, of course, then we have seen uh, more greenfield uh, projects to work on. Uh, but I wouldn't predict right now that we will see it turn around quickly uh, on that side. Um, the other question more on, the, on the industrial side in, in China, Matt. Sorry. Okay. Um, it, it pretty much follow the patterns we see that if you and, and I, I sorry to link it back when when we see a software out of course we report out to us uh, trucks and, uh, and cars and tier one. Uh, but that's the tier three, the tier four, the tier five, uh, which is normally defined as general industries. So many are very dependent on this industry, and this is the pattern I have seen throughout my career. Uh, and right now, I see then a softer demand in general industry, both in the industrial, uh, smaller size uh, compressor is also softer than in, in the past. So, yeah, confirming what you just said, it is our view right now. Mm. My second and final one is on is on services. So there was there was no growth in IT and, and PT. That is quite rare. I can see the equipment being pushed to the right, but it was a little bit surprising to see that services leveled off as well. Can you tell us a bit more about what happened? How do you think about the ability to grow services in IT and PT against this market weakness? Um, it, it starts in IT. Um, they start to become quite developed when it comes to uh, to contract linked to the digitalization. Uh, and I think that is something that we do uniquely uh, versus our competitors. Uh, so I think they have a, a, an upside to trying to link more uptime to service contracts. And that should be extremely valuable for someone making, you know, 60, 60 cars an, an hour. Uh, so that I see positively. Uh, on the other side, then, uh, there is a stronger correlation between equipment sales, maybe, and, and or service, uh, and, and uh, the line speed, in principle. So, if you reduce line speed with 20, 30 percent, you normally reset the service schedule on the tools as well. Uh, so that is, is a little bit of that's what I experienced 2008 as well. That, but if production is running with normal speed, and they don't, then you see that service can con continue. But there is a correlation with number of produced cars, so to say, them uh, versus uh, service. Thank you. The next question is from Ben Ugler of Morgan Stanley. Your line is now open. So, uh, thank you for taking the question. Hi, hi Matt. Hi, Hanzola. I guess uh, coming back to to the previous question, um, the the sort of softness or the change in industrial technique. Is that really what we're talking about, Matt? Is, is that primarily due to project push-outs, i.e. a kind of deferral within Asia? Is, is that the bulk of what's going on? And, and do you see, I mean, it doesn't sound like you see that changing anytime soon, but I just wanted to confirm that point. And then the second point is, if we look at the orders geographically across the group, North America is now at 2%. Can you give us a sense of how that trended sequentially within the quarter? I, the weakness uh, in general industry, is that something that was ongoing in the quarter? Is it more stable? How, how do we think about that coming into 1Q20? Thank you. Okay. On the first 
question on IT. Did you mean IT in general or, or general industry in industry techniques? Yeah, to clarify. No, sorry, I, I meant more the autos um, exposure in industrial technique. W within the press release, you kind of refer yeah. to push out of investment and projects. I may, I may be putting two and two in, uh, together and getting five, but in, in response to Klaus's question, you were talking about um, you know, d fewer greenfield projects, et cetera, in Asia. Uh, yeah. Are you basically talking about the same thing? Yes, yeah, yeah. um, and okay. if you if you remember on slide six, when we talked about the geographical development as well, you could see how mm -hmm. to actually being down in all geographical regions, with the exception of Africa, which is a very small region for, for industry techniques. So it's kind of common among all the auto OEMs. And of course, they are going through uh, some of them financial difficulties. They have cost out programs. At the same time, they're fighting lower volume. Uh, at the same time, they need to find capex down for for a new generation of cars, if that is a platform built for a hybrid or a full electric vehicle. Um, and what I'm saying is, in principle, we're in the middle of this right now, mm -hmm. and that we see in our numbers. Uh, it goes down geographically widespread. Uh, but we're in a good position when they start launching electric vehicle programs or hybrid programs, and we have the technology. So it's not that we're losing out market share to anyone. I think rather that we're actually gaining in, in, in uh, some uh, key accounts. Understood. And then just on on just your general sense of what's going on in North America, is that is that sort of stable toward the end of the quarter? Or are we because th that was a bit of a soft spot with Sandvik as well. Is that is that something that you see as a, a weak point globally or not really? Well, I don't see, think we we have identified any specific trends. Of course, with 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 the business like ours, there's quite a lot of investment in the in the. Um, in the numbers, I mean, in the graphs, if you look geographically, we don't distinguish between service and equipment. And of course, the the apart from the auto side, and and what we commented on the PT, I mean, the rental uh, companies in the U.S., uh, it's not that we see any any dramatic acceleration or deceleration of of of, of trends from from the from the previous part of the year, to be honest. Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit, uh, but IT is important in the U.S. and Western Europe as well as in China, of course, and they, they weigh uh, on the numbers, of course. Great. Thank you very much, both. The next question is from Lars Borsen of Barclays Capital. Your line is now open. Hi. Thanks for taking my question, Matt. Sorry to come back to the demand outlook. Uh, but clearly, I mean, if your orders are down sequentially in line with your demand outlook, that would imply a double-digit organic order drop year over year, albeit, of course, on tough comps from last year. But I don't think we've seen that since 2013. Um, I wonder what you are baking in in terms of, sort of the key variables. Um, I mean, this would be obviously for a Q1, which is typically is seasonally bigger in PT. It sounded like you were a little more tentative on the outlook in, in PT. And also, just specifically on IT, we talked a fair bit around automotive. Uh, can you remind us, please, how much is aerospace for you, and are you making in any disruption to the Boeing supply chain from the production dis uh, disruption we're seeing on the uh, 737 MAX? Um, let's see if I can keep up with you. Um, aerospace um, is the second biggest, normally the second biggest uh, uh, segment for general industry in industrial technique. Uh, and the one ahead is normally off-road. Uh, so I don't think we have defined it by size, but it's at least uh, number two. And uh, correct uh, that the Boeing business has been, been softer uh, for quite some time. Uh, I think that's what I can share with you on, on those accounts. Um, the second one. Yeah, I think you started, Lars, and I just wanted to make sure I understood. You said something that the, the out of the outlook it indicates sort of a double digit down, was that something you picked up from us or? 
Well, I, I think I, that's what really we want. Yeah, I mean, we, we can debate the numbers and I can come back to you offline, but I think if you're seeing orders down sequentially, I think that would suggest year over year we're talking about a double-digit organic order drop, and I appreciate the, tom, uh, the comps are tough, but I just wanted to well, understand... Yeah, go on. Let, let me make one comment there on the on the on the sequential. Our outlook is looking at economic activity at customer segments. That's what we tried to do. So we would have been much more explicit if we projected our order intake for for Q1. Now, if you look back historically, and you can see it in the graphs that we publish as well, Q1 tends to always be a, a very good. Uh, orders uh, intake quarter, and and uh, and that I mean uh, compared to Q4, for example, which actually has a little bit of completely the opposite pattern. Uh, is that something we drive, or is it just how our customer segments work? Well, you know, it's it's definitely not the drive from our side, but so it's more reflecting that that is a pattern that we have in our businesses. Uh, if it's if it's large uh, annual budgets that are managed uh, at customers or not, I don't know. But when we say an outlook like this, it is really trying to look at the underlying activity level uh, at customers. And then we don't make any specific projection that Q1 uh, order intake is going to be so much weaker or better or whatever than Q4. Uh, our statement in our mind could very well be combined with a higher order intake in Q1 than in Q4. And if you go back over 10, 15 years, like I have the luxury to be able to do, uh, you will find that that is actually absolutely true. Uh, in other words, Q1 is at a quarter over a year uh, strong. Q4 order intake over the over a full year is a weak quarter normally, and that is a pattern that we have seen uh, for many many years. That's why perhaps we don't make so many specific comments in that respect. I, uh, I understand, uh, Hans Ola. It was, it was only because you don't yeah. seasonally adjust your outlook, right? And there's a bit of seasonality in PT, and, and I didn't mean to suggest that you're down double digit. I just want to understand why would you not see the ordinary seasonal ramp, particularly in PT? And as I was pointing yeah. to, it sounded yeah. a mass introductory comment as though there was a little more tentativeness around what you're seeing in that part of the business. I just want to clarify that. Yeah. Yeah, I think you saw Matt's uh, slide when he commented on PT that Q1 2018 was like a rocket, and 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 that uh, comparison will obviously be a very tough one to beat. Uh, when you, when we go back a year, or let's say to April last year, the comments were very specific that we had made some very successful inroads on certain customer accounts in that, in that uh, geographic area, and, and that is not part of the normal seasonality. But again, I repeat, we don't normally see, and we expect that this year as well, that Q1 is, is a fairly good order intake quarter compared to the average over the year. As, uh, I, I, I should stop now because otherwise the message becomes confusing, even more confusing. But uh, did, was that somewhat helpful for you, Lars? So. No, it, it was. Thanks, Andola. Can I just clarify, okay. when you say your factories will be closed for one more week, does that in, include your entire China footprint? I just want to verify that, please. Uh, that is great. Normally, we are closed for uh, the New Year celebration, and now that has been extended one more week. That is great. That's clear. Thanks, guys. Thank you. The next question is from Gay Debré of Deutsche Bank. Your line is now open. Yes, good, good afternoon, everyone. Um, look, the, the book-to-bill ratio has been below one times uh, in the past uh, two to three quarters now at both PT and IT, um, with growth uh, actually turning negative now. So in your experience, uh, in terms of the lead times between PT, IT, and uh, and CT, uh, and given the order intake for uh, smaller compressors has just started to decrease as well, would you say that CT will follow the negative trend of PT and IT uh, into uh, 2018? Uh, 
2020. I'm not sure we have any uh, uh, empiric data on, on, on that scenario that you described, but I assume uh, if you have a softer market in general, uh, it, it would not be uh, too positive for, for uh, smaller capex investments if that is a compressor or a tool or, or something else that you need on. So, but I'm not sure I can correlate exactly to the scenario you described, um, that I don't have that. So you don't you don't really see any any specific lead times uh, between let's say IT and and CT in, in reality. Uh, no, not that we follow here now. Okay, then thanks very much. Can I can I ask also a second one on the uh, on the currency impact uh, because there was a big difference, uh, you know, between the the Q3 uh, effect and and the Q4 effect with. Q3 basically being a benefit of 80 bips for margins, and now in Q4 that's diluted by up to 30 bips, uh, and that was clearly not what I was uh, uh, forecasting myself. So uh, just if you could explain um, how come we have such a big difference on the transaction side uh, related to currencies. Well, uh, basically all of that from Q3 to Q4, uh, you can see that the development of last year plays in just as much as the development of this year, obviously, because we are comparing Q3 to Q3 first, and then we compare Q4 to Q4 last year. And uh, last year we had a, a weakening of the Swedish krona, we had a strengthening of the dollar uh, continuously, so to speak, at the end of the year, whereas in this quarter uh, we had the opposite. Uh, we had we had a moderation of the dollar strength. We had a comeback of the British pound, we had uh, a strengthening of the Swedish krona, we had a couple of uh, breaking trends compared to the first three quarters of the year, that's what I'm saying. So uh, internally, we were not that surprised that, you know, the analysis comes to that we, we actually lost on the margin compared to Q4 last year. That, uh, that uh, for me, is not, it's not so strange. Even if I understand, it surprised you. And, and what kind of guidance, sorry, did, did you give for Q1 already? Well, I mean, the only thing that we normally say is what um, absolute number do we expect to be uh, in Q1 compared to Q1 last year? And, and th there we believe we will see something similar to what we saw in Q4, Q4. Uh, bridge, which was 165, as you see in the report. Um, uh, that, that's just my, what that, at the end of the day, will mean for the margin uh, effect. Let's come back to that. It becomes too many unknowns to, to be a good guidance at this point, I would say. Okay. Thanks very much. Okay. Thank you. The next question is from Andreas Kofti of Nordea. The line is now open. Yes, thank you for taking my question. I have also two questions, and the first one is on the outlook as well. Uh, could you just please clarify if you said that you expect uh, and market demand in the semiconductor to be somewhat lower in the first quarter as well? Uh, no, I did not uh, specifically comment on that. Uh, what I said about the, the semi is that we see uh, the, the last few quarters that we have a great success is in uh, new technology from the more established players in the market, and that we can see both capacity and technology investment in, in China where we've also been successful. Uh, if you look at any of the statistics for um, semi industry, you see that utilization is not uh, increasing, it, it's rather flat. Uh, we have not seen so many capacity uh, investments linked to, to memory then, so uh, otherwise we did not specifically comment uh, going forward. But if we're going to be successful, we need to continue to go out and win the bigger orders, um, either for technology or, or capacity than in China. Okay, so you don't want to say what you expect in terms of end market demand for, for this specific segment? And we don't see an upswing on terms of, of the capacity that we have not seen. Okay. 
And then secondly, um, you talked about the turbo compressor in your report, and then you mentioned it also on the, the, the presentation. I understand this turbo compressor was for for low pressure applications, but uh, yeah, as you know, there are a couple of companies out there saying that they will move into high pressure applications as well. And I just wonder, what is your aftermarket opportunity in turbo compressors compared to screw compressors? Is it a significantly lower after aftermarket opportunity there? But we, have, we have seen uh, the different technologies, and uh, there are service opportunities also with the compressors that you refer to. That at least is our experience. Now this product does not compete uh, with the reference you make to, uh, to other companies. This is for another segment uh, at this point, at least. Yeah. Uh, so otherwise, I guess the is dig a little bit deeper when they meet up with uh, the compressor people. But uh, uh, as you know yeah. from the technology, it's less, uh, but it's uh, a small portion of the market. And we still believe that there are more energy efficient solutions for most of the applications that, that these we go after. Yeah, but it is a lower aftermarket opportunity in turbo compressors compared to screw compressors. For the technology do you, you refer yeah, to? Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. The next question is from Anna Kosland of Parity Security. Please go ahead. Uh, my question has already been answered. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yes, thanks. The next question is from Jack O'Brien from Goldman Sachs. Your line is now open. Hi, good afternoon. Um, my question is, uh, on vacuum technique and, and slightly longer term in nature, if we see a, uh, a another good year of, of, of growth in 2020, and I think consensus got around 10% growth, how, how should we think about margins evolving? Um, obviously, you've shown good margin resilience despite a challenging market earlier in the year. Um, do you see upside to the 25% margin? You've delivered if if uh, the market comes back strongly. Maybe also I can give you more granularity, but at least when I have discussions with with uh, the different divisions uh, and the business area, it's more a drive. Uh, we believe that the 20, you know, 23 to 25 uh, bracket of operating margin is it's a good one. Uh, and we are more trying to find more volume, new applications, new customers. That's really where we have uh, the focus. And um, also, if you want to, no, I, I think that's that's uh, really a full answer in a way because we've had the question uh, many times over the years, uh, mostly in the beginning uh, regarding compressor technique. But I think the answer when it comes to vacuum technique is is very similar. We really hunt for new applications or possibility to, to grow rather than drive the operating margin. Uh, and, and, and that takes quite a lot of effort mm -hmm. in terms of R&D, in terms of presence in the market, in terms of application knowledge, etc. So uh, you know that, uh, of course, when you have a, a short period of tremendous uh, load in factories and you can just sell out all, every, all the, uh, every capacity that you have, it will have a good impact short term on the margin. Uh, and we've seen a couple of those periods, but seen, as you said yourself, a little bit longer term, uh, the efforts are constantly put in, which of course means that we, we see value creation, but we might not see a dramatic margin growth, even if we are successful, so to speak. And also, I think we are trying to, from the other perspective, and trying to protect our, our margin, building the resilience. We are keeping investing in industrial services. We are building on the industrial product portfolio to get a better balance between uh, semi and industrial application in, uh, and scientific. So that's also an effort we are, we are trying to make over uh, the coming years as well. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Well, the next question is from Eddie Singer of Bank of America. Your line is now open. Um, yes, 
Yes, hi. Um, thanks for the call. Um, my question is uh, relating to your M&A strategy. Um, I've been quite active on M&A front in 2019 and uh, even in 2020 so far. Um, can you please uh, discuss your appetite for M&A for the rest of the year and whether do you see um, scope for sizable acquisition uh, this year? And, and also, uh, are there any specific end markets uh, you would prefer, uh, and especially any areas where you do not currently operate in? Thank you. Um, but I think we have the uh, capability and the balance sheet, of course, then to, to do things that we would like to do. And uh, out of the 21, now 22 divisions that we have, we would say that 20 of them have a green light then to go ahead and present a strategy, uh, what they'd like to do. And in some areas, um, we like to do more of, of the same uh, where that's possible. And in other areas, of course, we look at adjacent applications or adjacent uh, technologies like the, the cryo, for example, in, in, in semi. But what holds everything together, I would say, that we're trying to enter into things where we see that we can become one of the leaders in the segment. We do not want to be number three, number four, number five in the world. We really like to make sure that we can uh, invest enough. We would like to see products that is critical for, for our customers, uh, for that time or on their line. Um, we like to see if possible that there is an uh, opportunity to work with the customer on, on service and service contracts as well. Uh, and maybe the fourth parameter is that we're trying to find products where we can uh, uh, work a little bit on our outsourced model, do the final assembly ourselves. Uh, and, and we're looking, of course, in different areas depending on, on the division. I don't want to guide exactly what we're looking at, but we can see some last year then that, of course, we are trying out a little bit on the chiller side. Uh, fairly new to us is uh, dispense for uh, electronics, which is a huge market and, and expanding. Uh, the on-site the oxygen and nitrogen, uh, we have this under us as Coco Brown. We have strengthened it a little bit. That's something that we find interesting as well. And, of course, with the, the cryo acquisition, we, we enter into the chambers a little bit in, in same semi. And, of course, there we can also look at uh, adjacent applications. To that now we have the turbo compressors in there and also the cryo so maybe that uh, guides you a little bit on what we're looking at in terms of strategy and, and, and that uh, we have the potential then to uh, be, be active and to see if we can find something that generates value to our shareholders okay thank you there are no further questions at this time please go ahead speaker Thank you so much, and thanks to everybody participating on the call. Uh, I uh, then close the meeting and hope to speak to you again uh, when it's time for the similar conference call in April on the first quarter results. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.